This is Horror Podcast. Welcome to This Is Horror, a podcast for readers, writers, and creators. I'm Michael David Wilson, and every episode, alongside my co host Bob Pastorella, we chat with masters of horror about writing, life lessons, creativity, and much more. Now, today's guest is Catherine M. Valente. She's the New York Times best-selling author of over two dozen works of fiction and poetry, including Palimpsest, The Orphan's Tale series, Deflance, Radiance, The Girl Who Circumnavigated Fairyland in a Ship of Her Own Making, that's a hell of a title, and her latest releases, The Past is Red and Comfort Me with Apples both of which we'll be talking about in the second part of this conversation. But for this first part, we have so much. We, of course, talk about Kat's early life lessons growing up. We talk about Eurovision and the popular novel Space Opera. We talk about Peaks Island. We talk about musical performances and collaborations with S.J. Tucker and much, much more. But before any of that, a little bit of an advert break. Being an independent publisher, we are just like you. We share the same passion, the same love for horror fiction. We believe in the incredible work being created, unnoticed by the mainstream. And we want to share it with the world. We the Sinister Horror Company. From the host of This Is Horror Podcast comes a dark thriller of obsession, paranoia, and voyeurism. After relocating to a small coastal town, Brian discovers a hole that gazes into his neighbor's bedroom. Every night she dances and he peeps. Same song, same time, same wild and mesmerizing dance. But soon Brian suspects he's not the only one watching and she's not the only one being watched. They're watching is The Wicker Man meets Body Double with a splash of Suspiria. They're watching by Michael David Wilson and Bob Pastorella is available from thisishorror.co.uk, Amazon, and wherever good books are sold. Okay, well, with that said, here it is. It is Catherine M. Valente on This Is Horror. Cat, welcome to This Is Horror. Hi, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. I thought to begin with, I want to talk about some of the early life lessons that you learned growing up. And these don't necessarily have to pertain to story or writing, but anything you learned in your formative years. Oh, anything at all that I learned in my formative years? Um, Gosh, well, presumably I learned a lot. (laughs) <laughs> I, um, yeah, you know, I, I was actually, I was a horror fan from way back. Uh, I, my, my stepmother was like the biggest Stephen King fan you can imagine. So I was quite young st- stealing her books uh, and reading them. And I remember kind of one of the things that I took from them um, was that like a proper story is about bad things that happen to children uh because that's pretty much what all those books were about and that all the magic in america is on the east coast uh which isn't true but seemed like it at the time because every one of those books is set on the east coast it's kind of the natural home of american horror um i don't know what did i what did i learn as a child uh like i'm trying not to go dark that's why i'm <laughs> i'm hesitant oh i mean we're, we're we're all okay with dark we've had some some pretty bleak openers to these conversations. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, you know, most people will abandon you. Books are your only friends, that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> I learned that. Um, 
Yeah, I, I had a, um, a kind of an odd childhood. My parents were divorced when I was really young, so I would go back and forth between Seattle and um, California from an early age. So I was traveling on my own a lot. And I mean, I, I guess like, you know, relying on yourself was a big one uh, that I learned because I was kind of, all my siblings are half siblings. So I, I was um, the only one in my particular situation of having to travel like that. And uh, I did learn to kind of bury bury myself in books and uh, and rely on myself. Yeah, and I know before that you said in terms of being raised by your stepmother, it was a little bit like Snow White was a documentary of your life. So I wondered <laughs> yeah, if we I could mean, talk about that. Kind of a, like if you could see me right now, I look a lot like Snow White. My coloring is very similar. Um, but my stepmother and, and my siblings, they're all blonde and, and blue eyed. So I was very much like, you know, the, the dark haired, dark eyed, uh, weird kid. Um, and, uh, because, you know, my mother was this, who wasn't really involved with a lot of my childhood. So she was this mysterious figure and, uh, you know, there was all the kind of drama that goes with, um, being a child of divorce in the eighties and, and, uh, and not, not always feeling like you're related to anyone, you know, uh, you're, you're might as well run off into the woods and live with a bunch of dwarves. Like it, you can often look around when you're in that position as a child and just feel like you don't belong anywhere. Um, and and I, I certainly felt like that a lot as a kid. I mean, I think that most writers do feel like they didn't belong. I and mean, that's kind of why we create places where we belong. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And I mean, in terms of your own creations, when did you first start writing or telling stories oh i started telling stories as soon as i could talk yeah i mean yeah. I, i've i've quite literally seen i've seen video footage of uh me at four years old and we're hiking around mount rainier and i'm telling my parents a story about the wizard who lives under the mountain and they're not overly listening to me but like i clearly was driven to make up stories from from the minute i could i read very early as well um, but I didn't, what I wrote was poetry for the most part. You know, I wrote some stories here and there when I was very, when I was younger, but for the most part, poetry was kind of where my, my love was until I graduated from college. Yeah. And I mean, it sounds from what you've said both here and in previous interviews that your early reading taste was very eclectic. I mean, I know you've said you grew up reading science fiction, fantasy and horror and you know the distinction between genre was al almost something you didn't pay attention to they were all the same genre in a sense it's really true I, I just didn't think about that kind of stuff at all like i i kind of plowed through bookshelves on my own powered by my own interests and obsessions and so i i read all kinds of stuff but like it really didn't genre didn't make any difference to me at all and and that's continued through a lot of my life as i went on to major in classics and you know ancient greek literature doesn't differentiate between what we would consider fantasy and reality at all like the minotaur will show up in reality as far as they're concerned mm. um but when when i was younger like you know gone with the wind seemed pretty much the same kind of thing as a horror novel to me and I kind of stand by that idea now. Like there, there is a certain stance when you're just kind of coming toward coming to literature that you can take, where you you see the relationships between all kinds of stories and the you know terrible treatment of human beings and the you know feeling of of complicity and. Uh, and you know, just watching a, a story unfold that you know probably isn't going to end up happily. You know, it's just, it's a very similar feeling when reading an epic horror novel. Right. Well, I mean, another book that you read early on was *Wuthering Heights*, and I mean that can very <laughs> easily be described as a horror uh, novel too. Goodness. It sure is. Oh, I think. I mean, I I think that uh, Emily Bronte totally would have written. Uh, you know, like a horror serial killer you could totally see heathcliff as a serial killer uh yeah um i read that when i was 13 i read that really early um and i do remember just like the big revelation i took from that was that 
adults aren't any better at dating or love or romance than me and my friends in eighth grade. So things are just <laughs> never ever going to get any better. <laughs> yeah, I guess that kind of realization can be both liberating and also depressing. I mean, at least, you know, there isn't this higher standard that you have to aspire towards or you don't have to kind of quite yeah. realize what you're doing, but then you realize, God damn it, no one knows what they're doing. <laughs> but it's good to realize that. It's good to realize that people don't actually know what they're doing. And with something like Wuthering Heights, which is this classic novel, and as a 13-year-old, you, you hear classic novel and you invest it with a certain amount of authority. Um, and for, you know, a young American girl, not only is it a classic novel, it's a classic English novel. So this it, it must be full of people who, who know what the world is all about. Uh, and then it's just a bunch of people acting like idiots and jerks and just doing the wrong thing at every possible turn. Uh, so it was, it was certainly a, a revelation for me. Yeah, I mean, I'd love to say that British people have <laughs> advanced since that point, but, you know, acting like idiots, jerks, and making the wrong move at every turn. Yeah, yeah. we kind of have a habit of that. <laughs> but one thing that, uh, the, the, you know, the British Empire did right was manage to invest tons of other cultures with the idea that like British literature is the wisest and greatest thing of all time. So it took me a long time of approaching it that way. Like, well, this one surely will show me human beings at their best. <laughs> oh, not so much. Moving on to the next one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll take that as a win then, which is uh, more <laughs> than we can say for uh, Eurovision record, which <laughs> is a, a ridiculous segue into there space opera. <laughs> I'm sorry about this year. That was hard. <laughs> uh, yeah, but I mean, well, some of the things even the presenters were saying were not uh, <laughs> really doing much to uh, help our cause for the matter. <laughs> no. <laughs> but no, I mean, but... I mean, I I'd planned to to talk to you in in somewhat. Um, chronological order of your career <laughs> but as with most of these conversations it's gone out the window already because <laughs> yeah i want to talk about space opera it's essentially eurovision in space yep. so the the only requirement for um so, so there's different species kind of competing in the the metagalactic grand prix in this musical competition, the only requirement is for Earth not to come in last place if it doesn't want to be destroyed. <laughs> Unfortunately, the representation from Earth is British and it's uh, Decibel Jones and the Absolute Zeros, a name that perhaps doesn't inspire confidence to win <laughs> a competition like that. So <laughs> please tell us how this came about. <laughs> Oh, it's the most ridiculous story of how a book came to be written ever. It's it's straight up stupid. Uh, so I love Eurovision. I do. Um, I saw it for the first time in, in 2012 uh, in London. My friend Molly, um, I was there for um, a book tour, I think, for Fairyland, for the second Fairyland book. And uh, my friend Molly uh, and her husband Matthew had me over. Uh, to stay with them while I was there. And they said, but the one requirement is we are having a Eurovision party and you will have to watch it. And I said, and what's that? <laughs> and then my life changed. Uh, I genuinely, unironically, completely fell in love with it. And uh, so I began to live tweet it every year. So a couple of years after that, 2016, I guess it was, I was live tweeting as I usually do. And one of my fans in the Philippines uh, tweeted at me, ha ha ha, you should write a science fiction uh, or fantasy Eurovision, and I tweeted back, ha ha, that'd be fun. And five minutes later, literally, actually five minutes later, I got a DM in my inbox from an editor at Simon & Schuster saying, I will buy that right now. Uh, and my, my editor at Nava was every bit the Eurovision fan that I am, uh, and my agent still calls it the fastest deal in publishing. We had a deal in 24 hours. <laughs> Uh, and the contract literally still to this day, I should frame it, the contract still says Eurovision in space. It doesn't say, there's no title, there's nothing to it at all. And, um, you know, I, 
I had no ideas for it whatsoever. Even as I was signing the contract, my husband was like, do you, do you know what you're going to write? And I was like, mm -mm. <laughs> it's like, any ideas? It's like, nope, sign my name. Uh, and so when I sat down to write it, I spent about a week coming up with the name Decibel Jones and the Absolute Zeros and a couple of the other um, band names. And it, it really was an exercise in that this is my new band name. Uh, drinking game that people play uh I, you know songs and bands and things like that and then i kind of just went went off with it um i wrote the first chapter uh, very quickly and i kind of sat back and thought well how comfortable am i with being compared to douglas adams because that's what's going to happen if i consider with the book as as it it as it has come out so far um, and to some extent, if you're going to have British people in space, you will be like Douglas Adams is, is going to come into the conversation mm -hmm. one way or another. Um, but I, I, I made them British for two reasons. One was that um, of all of the countries that participate in Eurovision, uh, I have only lived in the UK uh, and therefore felt like I could write about it with some level of authenticity. Uh, I suppose technically I have I have spent some time in Australia, but I wouldn't say I've lived there. Uh, and two, I thought it would be funny because of the whole Neil Point thing. Uh, mm -hmm. Britain doesn't, the UK doesn't win Eurovision, so I thought it would be funny to have uh, have them save the world. Uh, and so ultimately, I decided, well, you know. There is something freeing about this. I am not going to sit down today and write the greatest science fiction comedy novel of all time. That's been done. Uh, I can shoot for the bronze comfortably. Uh, so I, I ended up writing this book as I as I wanted to write it, um, with very little compromise to what I wanted to do. Uh, it is a little much. It is a little over the top. It is uh, a little cheesy and ridiculous, but that's Eurovision. Uh, it also has some serious things to say, and that's that's very Eurovision too. It has a bunch of Easter eggs in it. Like every chapter is the name of a song that has been sung in Eurovision. Most of them are not winners, um, and all of the names of the aliens and the planets and the personal names of the aliens, all of that, they're words from the languages of participating Eurovision countries. So it is a big love letter to Eurovision, and it is also probably the closest thing to a sports movie I'll ever write. Uh, and, and just, uh, in some ways it's my love letter to the world too. It's just people and mm. the world we can do. Yeah. And I kind of like this concept of shoot for the bronze because, you know, we hear a lot of people saying, you know, to kind of shoot for the top. And then if you failed and you're probably going to be closer than you were if you hadn't tried at all. But the problem with that is like, well, if you shoot for the top, the other narrative is you become so paralyzed with self-doubt that you don't fucking do mm. anything. So if you aim for the bronze, then then you might actually get somewhere. So maybe yeah. that, that could be my lesson from this <laughs> podcast. <laughs> I was going to say, if you aim for the bronze, then you can't, there's confidence there. It's like, I'm yeah. going to win something. Yeah, and what I felt like I could add to the sort of aesthetic of, uh, of the Adamsian kind of space odyssey is I could get my gross American emotions all over it, <laughs> you know? Um, I, I, could, I could say way too many things about feelings, as Eurovision songs tend to do, uh, and, and use that kind of part of my culture where everything is overshared and... Uh, you know, straightforwardly, uh, far too sincere to sort of contrast that, uh, and that I might I might come up with something new out of that. Mm -hmm. Well, I wonder, given that you had to create so many different alien species, which were some of your favorites? Uh, maybe a top three. Sure, I love the Elecon. Uh, they're the, um, they're, they're the little guys who live on the all black planet, which is a real exoplanet, actually. Uh, I, I pulled some real, uh, planets that we've observed with our, our very powerful telescopes into it. Uh, so it's basically the surface of the planet is so black that it, it deflects light. So all of these, this whole species are, are, um, 
super small and uh, kind of creepy looking, and they're completely black from head to toe. I have big giant eyes to let in as most uh, as much light as possible. And their whole society was built because every other society used their planet to dump all of their uh, military secrets, bodies, anything they wanted to hide, they would just pitch it out the window into this planet. <laughs> Uh, and so they kind of scavenged the culture out of that. So I love the the Elecon. Actually, my car, my car's license plate has the name of one of them um, <laughs> on it. Uh, the I like the Smaragdi. They're fun. Uh, they're they're like these ten foot tall skeletal El Greco type looking aliens, but they um, like they have a severe cultural taboo against positivity. Uh, so they are constantly putting themselves down, but once you sort of understand what they're doing, you can hear that they're actually uh, really arrogant and bragging about themselves, but they're doing it by talking about what a, you know, terrible, non-sentient, uh, you know, pile of crap they are. Um, and have uh, stand-up modesty uh, open mic nights for, for <laughs> members of their culture to do that professionally. Um, I guess. Uh, oh, I do love. I, lo I love the Eska, who, who's the one that's in it, probably most. Um, the es Eska and the Keshet. So the Eska are are the ones who contact us first. They are somewhere between a flamingo and an anglerfish, but bright blue, and their voices um, have uh, access kind of infrasounds, the resonant sounds that make you feel religious in church or or afraid on a windy night. Uh, so they can kind of control people with their singing. But I love all my babies, all my alien babies. Uh, I made a lot of them. Uh, I think that they are all super cool. It was really important to me that they be wildly different, um, not just Star Trek aliens with a, a different sticker on their forehead. Because I'm not limited by budget or anything like that. So, you know, I kind of noted down a lot of different alien types that I wanted to... Um, to write about so there's kind of a predator type uh like the movie predator and uh there's a ai and and all of that kind of stuff i mean like i've said those three and now i'm like how could i not have said the yurt mac how could i not have said the Kesha? uh but i do love all my babies yeah and in terms of kind of coming up with these species i mean did you kind of research a lot and just read up on various things until you were inspired? Or, I mean, what, what did that look like? I mean, as, as someone who's never had to create 20 <laughs> plus alien species pretty quickly. Yeah, I mean, that was, I knew that was gonna be a really difficult part of writing the book that I would have to come up with, if not as many alien species as there are Eurovision countries, at least, a, a reasonable facsimile of that number. So I knew I'd have to come up with at least 20 and probably more. Um, so some of them come from uh, like weird animals on earth. So, you know, the extremophile species, the uh, Alunazar are based on sea squirts, which is about the simplest life form you can come up with. Um, and uh, the Keshet are red pandas. That was just a joke. I just thought that would be funny because I think they're the cutest animal. <laughs> um, so I, I just, yeah, neither red nor pandas. Um, and uh, so a, a lot of, yeah, a lot of them come from just the weird stuff that you can see and find even on our planet with, you know, billions of species. And uh, then some of them are like, I wanted, I knew I wanted to have a disembodied AI species because there's lots of AI in science fiction, but, you know, the fact that AI doesn't actually need a body in any way um is something i don't see done very often so uh that's that's the 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 three two one are the um the ai species uh yeah and some of them are jokes you know like some one of them's algae i tried to like spread it among the sort of types of life that we even notice and have here so we've got the algae ones you know we've got ones that have flesh and are sort of mammalian we've got reptilian ones we've got um you know rock essentially the Uterac. Um, you know, every kind of sort of phylum kingdom is sort of evenly represented. And then I started looking up exoplanets, as I mentioned, and uh, sort of reverse engineering from there, what kind of species do I think would would evolve on this planet? Um, and what, what sort of 
culture would they evolve from that? There's an element of solving puzzles about that. You know, you, you've got kind of these parameters and you, know, you work forwards or backwards from that. It's really quite a lot of fun. Um, and then like, I knew I was gonna have a gamer species where you never actually see them, you only see their avatars. It was basically so I could make a deuce point joke. Uh, it was a long way to go for that joke, but I uh, did get there. Um, yeah, so they, they just kind of come from observing the weirdest kind of life you can see right in front of you right now and putting that out in space as well as little jokes at the expense of the body of science fiction literature. <laughs> yeah, well, I think, you know, it's a good idea to go to enormous lengths purely to make an in-joke or <laughs> you know, things like that. I, I'm a fan of that, <laughs> taking it far too far. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I mean, I wondered too, and even though I'm sort of linking this question to space opera, I could link it to most of your work, but how do you approach writing a book that is simultaneously a comedy, but also pretty bleak? Yeah, I mean, for all the glitter of space opera, it is pretty bleak. Um, but again, like I, I felt that that that's part of Eurovision too. Mm -hmm. um, you know that it started after the war as a genuine attempt to sort of unify the continent and maybe maybe less of the murder and more of the singing. Um, and all through the history of the contest, you know, we've we've seen judges give their points out while missiles are flying overhead. We've seen you know during the Balkan crisis um you know bosnia coming and singing this amazing song directly about it even though you're not supposed to sing about politics and all of that is kind of at the crunchy core of your vision so i wanted to get at that but on the other hand that's just what you say on a book tour the fact is i wrote this book in january january through march of 2017 <laughs> which is when trump was inaugurated mm -hmm. and i didn't feel like i could just write a happy book i had to say something like it was just such a and it when i say it was a bleak time it's so much bleaker <laughs> it got so much bleaker but it seemed like it was as bad as it was going to get then and uh so if i was going to be able to write it all i had to say something about all of that so there is some discussion of fascism and, and the worst of humanity and, and everything else in the book. When the question is, is humanity a sentient race? And the answer is not an automatic yes. Then these are the things that you you ultimately um, have to examine. Um, and I, like, I mean, I've been doing it, like you say, it can apply to a lot of my work because from pretty much the jump, I've been putting comedic scenes in very serious dramatic works. I love doing that. It's a lot of fun. Um, Deathless is a, another book of mine, and that's um, set during World War II, during the Siege of Leningrad in Russia. And there's a, a number of very funny sequences about communism and Russian folklore. Uh, and I've, so I've been combining those things for a long time, and I think that there's a certain natural union of, of that, of the, the, the grim and the giggles like it, it's a uh, it's gallows humor it's it's the way that we find a kind of catharsis that lets us get through um the grim and the bleak so uh it, the difference with space opera is that its sort of primary genre was comedy and secondary genre was science fiction um rather than primary genre being science fiction and and then it's got some some funny in it um so it it really made me take a, a different approach uh and and you have to kind of open up uh the dimension of of what's funny as well as what what moves the plot what illuminates character what is you know pleasing to the ear um what's going to make people laugh is this whole other dimension to it uh so it was a it was really kind of a grueling writing process honestly uh i asked my husband to never let me say uh, either of these two things were easy, being pregnant and writing space opera. <laughs> <laughs> they were not, I, I know that my memory will, will want to change it to those things being easy, but it really wasn't. It was, a, it was one of the most challenging writing experiences of my career. Um, but my favorite thing to do really is like 
go along like we're all having this happy, you know, psychedelic, glittery good time and then punch people right in the heart. That's kind of my whole gig. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it, it, the, there's very short chapters in Space Opera, which kind of helps. It means you can, if you once you've set up that rhythm and that pattern, you can kind of turn on a dime and people accept it. Um, but I think the best parts of the book are, are where, even in the same sentence, you have those things um, crossing paths so that a sentence will start out, you know, lighthearted and and, and very wistful or, or um, very stern or starts out stern or wistful and, and ends up funny. So um, all of those contrasts are, are just really pleasurable things to write and I think pleasurable to read too. Yeah, and of course the short chapters also just wonderfully ties into the Eurovision contest in general. I mean, these short songs and then on, on to the next. Yeah, well, and you know, so so many of my American readers, and I, I was well aware, and I think that this is part of why my publisher didn't expect it to be the success that it became. I was well aware I was trying to sell a Eurovision book to American readers who literally have never heard the word Eurovision in their lives. Um, it went better than expected, and way more Americans know about Eurovision now than they did <laughs> in uh, you know 2018 when it came out. But uh, one of the things that no American reader seems to get, I, the only people I ever hear from complaining about it are Americans who are like, I don't understand why there are these little chapters about like the history of a particular planet in the in the music competition. Like, I didn't get why we needed that. And I'm like, it's literally in your, this is how Eurovision is. Just watch Eurovision. They're called postcards. They have the little things before each song with all the object, all the favorite objects of the singer and everything. So even the structure of the book is based on the structure of the grand final. Um, it's, it is, you know, stapled to it at every point. Yeah, well, we certainly appreciate you and then Will Ferrell in more recent years doing <laughs> the work to spread the good word about Eurovision. <laughs> <laughs> well, from planets to countries, you've lived in a number of countries, as you alluded mm -hmm. to earlier. And so not only in your childhood were you going between Seattle and California, which I'm aware are the same country, just to put that out there. But then, you know, you lived in the UK, in Edinburgh, you lived in Japan, you're now currently residing on Peaks Island. So, I mean, I wonder, what have you learned, both from living in these different places, and then specific lessons to some of those places? Oh, I mean, I so I have all I, from whether it's from my childhood or just inborn. Um, I've always had the travel bug, wanderlust, and mm -hmm. and um, I lived all over the place and um, in multiple countries in just about every part of America. Uh, sometimes, as when I lived in the American South, what I learned was I hate it here. I never <laughs> want to live here again. Uh, and I was I wasn't a huge fan of living in the Midwest either, but. Um, you know, I, I learned how much I love Four Seasons and, and, you know, being able to sort of track time that way. When you live on the West Coast, it's not the same because so much it's evergreen in, in Seattle. You, you don't really ever see the leaves turn much and they just don't even bother. They just drop off in one night in California. And then the winter is never really particularly cold. So I, I, I learned how much I, I really do better in those climates. Um, God, I mean, I loved living in Edinburgh. Uh, I really did. It was such a, it's such an extraordinary city. Um, I think it was, the, it's probably the only time in my life that I have lived in a place where it is just convenient to be on foot. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I could, I could walk to any of the cultural entertainment that I ever wanted from, uh, you know, CC Blooms, which is the best gay club I'd ever seen, to, uh, you know, very, very fancy theater uh, during the festival. Um, so it was, it's probably the best, I'm not a, really a city girl, but 
I am an Edinburgh girl. I love that city to death. And and that's probably the only city I would I would consent to live in. Um, so sometimes what I learn is I love it here and I wish I could live here forever. Um, I, boy, Japan was just a series of lessons over and over and over uh, because of, uh, I was there because my first husband was a naval officer, um, but I didn't know anything about it. I, uh, and the internet was still in its toddlerhood. Uh, so I was just totally lost and none of the other Navy wives liked me because I was young and punky and I had a nose piercing, <laughs> dyed hair. Um, so they like, they wouldn't help me figure anything out either. So, I mean, I guess I learned that, that I can figure anything out eventually. And, um, I learned to be on my own in Japan. I think that's, that's the most important thing I learned, um, you know, my first husband was at in the Iraq war. He was gone almost the whole time we were there. So it was just me and my dog. And um, I had to figure everything out by myself and uh, sort out my own anxiety about like taking trips on my own because I didn't for the first year I was there. I didn't go anywhere because I, I was so anxious about it. But it was clear my husband wasn't coming back and I wasn't going to waste the time I had in Japan. So, you know, I started planning trips for myself and I got over that anxiety of, of, of not having anyone else with me um, to help if something went wrong. But I learned to be by myself and, and that's really where my writing career started. Um, it's not where I wrote my first book at all. Uh, in fact, I started my first book in Edinburgh and I finished it in Rhode Island. Um, but it was where I wrote The Orphan's Tales, um, at, or at least the first volume of it, and kind of where I learned a work ethic and a, and how to work from home before everybody had to work, learn to work from home 17 years later. <laughs> um, but, uh, but how to do that. And again, I had no one to help me and the internet was not half so full of advice uh, as it is now on, on such specific things. There was no such thing as YouTube children. Uh, it did not yet exist. So yeah, where, where I kind of became who I am as a worker um, that all happened, uh, in Japan. You learn something different everywhere. Honestly, it's a really good question. Um, and in Maine, what I've learned is how to live in a village, how to not just be on my own all the time, how to, uh, rely on my neighbors and be a, be a neighbor that someone can rely on, uh, and how to make connections with people who are really different than me. Um, you know, Maine lobstermen were not uh, people that I, I had really met before. Uh, and there's lots of different kinds of people on this island. The, I'm, I'm being a little facetious by saying lobstermen. There's actually not very many. Um, but I've learned to, to live with a small group of humans I didn't pick or give birth to or give, mm. who had given birth to me. Uh, and and it, that's been really something as well. Yeah. How, how did it come to be that you lived on Pete's Island? <laughs> um, so we were talking about Stephen King and how I thought all the magic in America was on the East Coast. Well, he, he of course, lives in Maine very famously. And um, I like, like I wanted to go to the place where magical things could happen when I was little. And I really liked blueberries a lot. So I kind of got fixated on Maine when I was a little kid um and i was also the kind of child who imagined where they were going to live when they grew up that wasn't where they were uh and maine is the furthest you can get from the west coast on on a map in america uh so i always kind of had a fixation on it and i didn't want to live in cleveland anymore um so i can work anywhere my husband was working from home so we kind of drew up some parameters, the, the four seasons, snow, ocean, which it kind of lands in New England um, in America. So uh, I was like, well, we could live in Maine. And so I pulled up Craigslist and the most recent rental was a year round rental on Peaks Island. Um, and those don't come up very often. I, I feel like I didn't even realize then how much those don't come up. I don't even think anybody advertises year-round rentals on Craigslist anymore because you can you can find people desperate to live here so fast. 
so we took it sight unseen. I was 29. I uh, couldn't afford to both go check it out and move there. So I just moved to an island in the Atlantic Ocean I had never seen before. And I was 29 years old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it, it seems to be working out quite well for you. Yep, yep. And, you know, the, the majority of it's such a strange thing to think about now because it never felt like that until recently. Um, but the majority of my career has has taken place here. Uh, I moved here right before Palimpsest came out. So the Orphan's Tales had come out and the sort of short, small press novels had come out. Um, I moved here in November. Palimpsest came out in February. So essentially, uh, like, the uh, everything bar one book that has made me who I am as a writer that has been successful enough to continue this life for me that has defined you know who I am as an artist to the world has all happened on this island pretty much so there you go I think the magic really does happen in Maine <laughs> that is the takeaway <laughs> so maybe now the demand you know, for living in Maine has increased even more as people listen to this and they think right of all the writing and creative takeaways from this episode clearly the main one is just move to maine <laughs> <laughs> you know mm-hmm. michael i've told that story a lot of times and uh neither neither have i nor anyone else pointed out that yeah the magic did happen in maine yeah <laughs> <laughs> all that all the times i've told that story <laughs> I mean, it sounded like you gave quite a persuasive pitch to your husband in terms of moving there. But I mean, really, I think you should have just been able to say two, two, two points. Blueberries, Stephen King. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> you should have said, right, no further questions. Let's do it. I'm not, I'm not a person. I, like to prepare for moving to Japan, I read a book of Japanese fairy tales. Like I just... Um, my brain does not work along normal paths, but my ex-husband now, um, he's actually the one who sealed it for me because I kind of started to panic at the last minute. And he said, look, if we hate it, then we've got a year's worth of stories about that time we lived on an island in Maine. And that's better than having a year's worth of stories about living in some random suburb. Uh, so that that sealed the deal for me. So he was he was on board all the way. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's the good thing about being a writer or creative anyway, that when bad things happen, it's like, well, I mean, there could be some stories to tell, perhaps some hilarious anecdotes. I mean, sometimes with the woeful things that happen, it's a bit of a stretch to make them hilarious. But, you know, I have confidence that if anyone can do it, it is you. Thank you. (laughs) So... I know as well that you've spoken about being an actress for years. So I I think even before getting into writing. So when did you first get into acting? Um, Really early on, uh, my grandfather owned an ad agency in Seattle, so or ran one. And um, I was in a few commercials. And then I was in plays. I, I was in plays for a long time. And, uh, you know, I, I, some of them are high school and college and stuff, but the thing you have to understand about high school plays in Davis, California, is it was not like high school plays are in other places. Um, at the time, that city had five fully funded theater companies in it, and it was a city of 50,000 people. It was right near the Bay Area. Like, my drama teacher was also a professional actress and, like, going to shows right after school to perform. Um, so the the productions I was in were, were very serious productions. Uh, and there was also a, a whole theater company called Acme for um, kids 13 to 18 to do every part of a show from directing to tech to all of that. So I was involved in everything I could be. Um, and I had some pain stage work after that. Uh, and then really I got to a point where I was really enjoying it and I had written some plays and and directed and had them put on and and everything and and I did really enjoy it but I was in college and I felt like everybody else was a lot more you know committed to trying to make it in Hollywood or New York or or something and I I did I knew I didn't want to do it for a living um 
and so I I shifted over to tech and I did tech for another couple of years um, and stage managing and stuff. And then uh, I kind of just quit. Unfortunately or unfortunately, uh, it's still a huge passion of mine. And the fact is that I get to act all the time now. I've done my own audio audiobooks. I do readings all over the place. I've act plenty. Um, but uh, it was it was certainly the passion of my life uh, up until uh, writing took over. Yeah, and I guess linked into acting, you've also put on a number of musical performances and collaborations with S. J. Tucker. Yes, I have. The other the other sense in which theater has never left my life. Mm. Yeah, well, I mean, SJ is a, an extraordinary artist, and I was a huge fan of hers before we ever met. Um, but we we clicked the second that we did meet. We've been sisters since the day we met. Um, and she's done four albums based on my books. Uh, we've toured for them. Uh, and with Palimpsest, uh, we toured for four months across the country from Maine to LA selling that book out of the back of her truck. So she is, she is definitely one of my, one of my partners in life. Yeah. How was it that the two of you met? We met at a con, ah. uh, at Lunacon, uh, which is, uh, a real, quite a venerable old New York convention. Um, and gosh, what year was that? Uh, I want to say that was 2005. I think it was 2005. Um, which means that we've known each other for 16 years and that's just absurd. I can't even <laughs> get my head around that. Um, but yeah, I mean, we had, we, we had our sons exactly 30 days to the minute apart. Um, we are very in sync. Uh, that that girl and I, I highly recommend everyone check out her her work because she's fantastic. Thirty days to the minute. That's... To the minute. <laughs> I just wanted to to clarify that this is literally <laughs> not not the literally that some people use to mean not literally, but actually literally. Actually, <laughs> September twenty, October twenty fifth. Damn. Wow. I mean, I wonder as well how, how it even goes from, you know, you meet at a con, you strike up an amazing friendship simultaneously, but then it goes to, I'm going to make four albums based on your books. I mean, I'm sure that wasn't the exact thing <laughs> that was it. said. I mean, it must have <laughs> un unwound more I get organically than that, but even to make one album based on your book. Oh, I had given her... Um, I think it was a galley of the Orphan's Tales, because I don't think it was out yet, of the first book. Uh, and, you know, we'd talked about albums based on books earlier in the evening. I'm not going to say that, like, it was a bolt out of nowhere, like, that had come up. Um, albums based on books. Uh, and, and we talked about, like, Poe and House of Leaves and all this other stuff. And uh, she was staying with us in Cleveland, and I remember so clearly, like it was yesterday and not 16 years ago, waking up in the morning and she came flying out of the guest room, just face a light and holding her guitar and saying, I wrote you a song, listen. And it, it was the first song on the first Orphan's Tales album. And, you know, I think anyone listening, if you go listen to that first song, uh, you can probably feel what I felt because it's an amazing tune. It's a really, really good song. Uh, and it's kind of like, I don't know, it's like one of those moments in the movies where you turn the radio on and the radio is talking about you, you know? Mm. <laughs> those things that never happen in real life. Um, and, you know, we did a few shows together, reading concerts is what we call them. We did a few shows together for The Orphan's Tales. Um, maybe, maybe a little more than a few now that I'm thinking about it, because there were two books and she did an album for each of them and both of them had touring. And then we, we did, you know, quite long versions of it at conventions. Uh, gosh, I seem to remember somewhere in the back of my head, us like half turning it into a play at the request of one of the conventions and being very uncertain about that, but doing it. Um, and then, 
Palimpsest was the big tour uh, because the economy had crashed and my publisher had been reorganized back into Random House. So no one was marketing the book at all. So it was either do something big or uh, let it fail. And it was only my third book with big New York presses. And like, if that one failed, it, it kind of might have all failed. So we did something drastic and we went on this huge tour. Uh, it was just god i just i don't even remember how many cities we we stopped in every city that we could get to um we took 40 fans on a train from chicago to new orleans and had a masked ball in new orleans um we did our shows everywhere from a beautiful hotel to a sports bar uh like we we did everything we picked up performers in every city that we passed through so sometimes we had snake dancers and sometimes we had aerial artists and sometimes um we had our wonderful cellist betsy tinney and um and uh, the singer vixie vixie and tony um with us and sometimes it was just sj and i uh but we were the circus and we came we blew through town and and then on yeah, and the success of Palimpsest really paid off because, I mean, not only did you get a Hugo <laughs> nomination, but you got a husband, and most Hugo nominations don't come with a husband, in fact. So I guess you, know, you were lucky in that sense. <laughs> yeah, well, so, I mean, first of all, it completely blew me away that it was nominated. I didn't even have that on my radar as a possibility like gosh I, I was so young um i don't even think i'd turned 30 yet and uh it was just like i thought oh well maybe in 20 years if i'm really lucky i'll get nominated for a hugo like it, it never occurred to me that was going to happen i think i might have actually blacked out a little when the email came through but uh it was in australia um so there was no way I could afford to go. And that was fine. But it actually turned out that Expedia had screwed up this whole trip of mine. And so I had a voucher from them, an I'm sorry voucher. It had all these uh, stipulations on it. So I could only use it all at once. And it had to be on one trip. And it would only I could only spend it on me. I couldn't split it with anybody else. Uh, and it was pretty much the price of a round trip ticket to Melbourne and, and two weeks in a hotel. And um, I I do remember it. I remember it very clearly looking up during my reading and thinking, wow, there's a really cute boy in the front row. <laughs> uh, and that cute boy is the father of my child and my husband now. It's a it's very strange world out there. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So we we started talking in the bar, and uh, I guess the rest is history. Yeah, it's funny how these moments happen in life as well. You know that you you couldn't possibly go to Australia, but then you get this voucher <laughs> with such specific <laughs> terms, and then you it's, look at the value it's... of it. You look at the round trip price, and mm -hmm. here you are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's it's it honestly it's kind of terrifying to think about. I think about it when I look at my son sometimes. Like, do you know how easy it would be for you to have never come close to existing? Like yeah. it would have been so <laughs> any anything along this series of events and it wouldn't have happened. Um, but did. Yeah, it's a strong thing to say to a child, but sometimes you've got to spit truth. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, you've said before, you've spoken very openly about having ADD. So I'm wondering, as a creative, what are some of the advantages and disadvantages of being a creative with ADD? Well, I mean, the advantage is hyper-focus. I mean, one of the, it, I'm sure that most people have heard this by this time, but ADD is incredibly poorly named. Um, ADHD. It, it's not just an attention disorder that that is a small part of it, and you know a lot of people don't even have the hyperactivity part. Um, it's an executive disorder. Uh, so 
we can focus on things, but it's all or nothing. So it's either I am ride or die a hundred thousand percent, not eating, not drinking, just focused on this thing, or I can't finish a page reading about it to save my life like it, it's very all or nothing um or at least it was when i was unmedicated and uh that but it is a big advantage to be able to pour that focus into a book and i i i used to talk about my process and i used to say that i my whole work ethic is just out racing my terrible personality because I didn't understand that what I meant by my terrible personality was that I have ADHD and no one's ever told me. Uh, even though it's kind of crazy because The Orphan's Tales is practically screaming out, uh, I have undiagnosed ADHD. It's, it's, it is the ADHD novel. Um, but yeah, so that's pretty much the advantage that, that once that switch flips, there's nothing that could pull you away from it. It's switching that or, or flipping that switch at all uh, that is difficult. And, you know, because I, I used to talk about writing books in 30 days. And I did write. I wrote Palantest in 30 days. I've written several of my books. Uh, but that was, that was outrunning ADHD. I just didn't have medication. I didn't understand it at the time. And I still write books fast because it's much better for me uh, to use that hyper focus uh, to push through a draft um, as quickly as possible. And, you know, we can f fix it if it's uh, not great when the hyper focus passes. But the disadvantages are, are just getting that switch flipped is, is virtually impossible without medication and a, and a lot of tools um we're not terribly organized people uh most of the time and uh i've always had real trouble with that but that's why again the hyper focus i i pretty much keep my books in my head because i never really learned how to take good notes i just learned how to take good doodles um so i do some some outlining and and note taking but most of it's just kept in my head um and that's a shaky proposition, but I don't really know any other way to do it. So there, there, it, it's a mess being a creative ADHD person, but there are a lot of things about it that end up with a pretty unique perspective. And if you can kind of just hold on to just enough tools by the, the skin of your teeth, uh, then you can access that hyper focus and, and produce things. But I, I, I hear tell that there are people out there who don't have trouble with any of that. It seems unrelatable to me, but um, I've heard they exist. <laughs> yeah, and I guess if you're keeping the majority of your book in your head, that's another reason why, you know, it's advantageous to you to write these books quickly because, you know, yeah. you need to um, exercise it, as it were, to get that out of your head. <laughs> <laughs> And I mean, if you're not writing them in 30 days, but still pretty quickly, I'm wondering what, what would you say is the kind of time it takes you to write, I guess, a novel length work these days? It absolutely depends on the book. And since I had my son, I'm, I'm not quite as fast as I used to be because uh, there's this whole other um, world building exercise mm -hmm. that needs doing. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, but like I, I wrote Fairyland in eight weeks. That's a pretty good. That's that's quick, but it, it's a good representation of, of how long it takes me to to put out a book. It's it's really that once I sit down, there's a lot of work that's already been done, of planning it and imagining it and living with the characters and just you know, making plans to write takes a lot longer than the actual typing. Um, so once I sit down, I, ha I, I have a lot of pre-work done, uh, but yeah, between, between two and three months, um, once I actually start the, the actual physical typing is usually about right. Yeah. And how many projects do you normally have on the go at once? Is it common for you to be writing one book, but then also doing pre-work on another? Oh, absolutely. Um, that's 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 very common. Um, I I'm a little backed up at the moment because I'm still catching up with uh, 
you know, my, my maternity leave mm. uh, work that ev- everything kind of just gets shifted forward quite drastically, even with a, a, a small delay in publishing. Um, so I'm still kind of catching up with all of that. Uh, but yeah, it's, um, it's just deceptive. It's deceptive. And then there's the editing process on top of that. But the, the first flush of writing really like two or three months, that's my ideal time span. And I'm I'm working like right now I'm working on, and I'm working on the sequel to Space Opera. I'm working on a big project I can't tell anybody about, um, and that's kind of it for the next two and a half months as I finish the book. But if I wasn't actively like in that two to three month window of of you know physically typing a novel right now. Um, I would also be doing short stories and I would probably have an article or an essay I was writing and I have my Patreon that I do every uh, content for every month. Um, and then on top of that, I might be doing some freelance work for some other company I can't talk about. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of can't talk about things uh, in, in, in writing, but yeah, I'm usually working on multiple things at once. Yeah, and I mean, one thing it seems you can talk about, at least to a, a point, is the sequel to Space Opera. Mm-hmm. Am, am I right in thinking it's titled Space Oddity? Yes, it is. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. What can you tell us about Space Oddity? Um, yeah, so uh, it basically picks up where the previous one left off, um, and it concerns the uh, discovery of the next borderline sentient species and needing to make decisions, uh, the same decision that was made for Earth for them. Uh, and of course, Decibel Jones is the one who discovers that species. Uh, so it's um, it's a it's a little different, but we will still have our, our song contest in it. And um, it's certainly different because what happened between selling this book, the sequel, and writing it is that Eurovision was canceled for the first time. Mm. So uh, it also involves that. Wow. Well, I am very much looking forward to it. And I mean, you know, you said before that there was some pressure in a sense in knowing that there will be comparisons to Douglas Adams so you know why not up the ante by calling it space oddity (laughs) why not add a little bit more (laughs) look I mean I I, there's so much there's so many references to Bowie in in the first book it it might as well be called that too yeah Uh, but I, I I mean I figured I would I would be forgiven that it's just such a good pairing with space opera and it, it fits the story so well, uh, but yeah I mean my what well, my my protagonist's surname is Jones his first name starts with D the whole thing is is a Bowie love letter it's yeah. just uh, a more low key than the Eurovision love letter right yeah yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to the first part of the conversation with Catherine M. Valente. Join us again next time for the second and final part. But if you'd like to get that ahead of the crowd, if you'd like to get every episode ahead of the crowd, then become our patron at patreon.com forward slash this is horror. And not only do you get early bird access to every episode, but you can submit questions to each and every guest. And you get a number of bonus podcasts, including the Patreons Only Q&A sessions, the video cast on camera off record, and Story Unboxed, the horror podcast on the craft of writing. There's also a wonderful writers forum over on Discord. So head over to patreon.com forward slash this is horror and see if it's a good fit for you. Okay, before I wrap up, A little bit of an advert break. From the host of This Is Horror Podcast comes a dark thriller of obsession, paranoia, and voyeurism. After relocating to a small coastal town, Brian discovers a hole that gazes into his neighbor's bedroom. Every night she dances and he peeps. Same song, same time, same wild and mesmerizing dance. But soon Brian suspects he's not the only one watching and she's not the only one being watched. They're watching is the Wicker Man meets Body Double with a splash of Suspiria. 
They're Watching by Michael David Wilson and Bob Pastorella is available from thisishorror.co.uk, Amazon, and wherever good books are sold. Being an independent publisher, we are just like you. We share the same passion, the same love for horror fiction. We believe in the incredible work being created, unnoticed by the mainstream. And we want to share it with the world. We are the Sinister Horror Company. As always, I would like to end with a quote. And this is from Alan Watts. This is the real secret of life. To be completely engaged with what you are doing in the here and now. And instead of calling it work, realize it's play. I'll see you in the next episode for the second part of the conversation with Catherine M. Valente. But until then, take care of yourselves, be good to one another, read horror, keep on writing, and have a great, great day. This is Horror Podcast.